and welcome to another Life Story, coming to you live on Life Stories Worldwide. My name is Alan Jones. We bring you stories from all across the world, and the stories go out all across the world. We bring you stories of people who've gone through all types of uh, trials and tests and different struggles, and how they've come through and how those lives have been transformed. We're live on StreamYard, on Zoom, on Facebook, and YouTube, and also we are live on our own website. You can watch this on the website, lifestoriesworldwide.com. I encourage you to go to our website. You'll find lots of information there about Life Stories. You'll find how you can contact us too on that website. Uh, I would like to give you an invitation to our Life Stories convention, which is going to be held in Newport, South Wales, on the 28th of October. You will find information about that on the website. We have a wonderful speaker, Dave Smethers, who shared his story on Life Stories. I also encourage you to become a partner with Life Stories and help us in spreading this message all over the world. Well, tonight we bring you a story from the UK, uh, from the northeast of, of the UK. We have a wonderful guest tonight. I will go and introduce in a moment, Graham Seed. Uh, Graham was a, a former football hooligan from being very young, and uh, he could he spent four years in prison, uh, or he spent quite a number of years in prison, and at, at his worst, he could drink 28 pints of cider without any problem. And uh, he got involved with a football hooligan gang, which he'll be able to share with you, but he also had other experiences in his life and uh, seen God work in a tremendous way. So I'm going to hand over to Graham now to share his story. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, as Alan said, my name is Graham Seed. I'm from Middlesbrough in the northeast of England. And uh, I just want to say a couple of things, really. One is uh, when I share my story, I wouldn't never boast about anything. Uh, I don't think I'm clever or, or anything like that, but I'm going to share and also, I don't lie, I found out my life was uh, very much a lie, but now I live by the truth. And I found out very quickly that, you know, Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And I was always looking for the truth, to be fair. I was always looking for to where I'd fit in. And uh, I usually start my story uh, in school, in prison, in churches, wherever I am. Uh, around about the age of nine and, and things start happening in my life. I become very curious about why I didn't have a dad when uh, everybody seemed to have a dad, even my friend who wasn't, uh, didn't live with his dad and, you know, he all of a sudden tells me he's going to see his dad and I'm wondering why I haven't got a dad and I'm wondering what what's going on there, you know. Anyway, so... I find out that um, I don't need a dad, apparently. Uh, I've got my nan and granddad and me, my mum, and they tell me they love me. And that word love was a, a fascinating word when I was young, and it became a fascinating word when I got older. Um, but around about the age of 10, my uh, mother got married and she went to live uh, a couple of miles away from where I was living. And um, I, it was really, um, as though well, I didn't say this, but it really hurt me a lot. And we were living in a, in a kind of a, a nice um, estate. It was, I wouldn't say it was posh, but cars had tax on. And uh, <laughs> one of the things I did notice was milk bottles on the doorsteps. And uh, where I was from on the estate, that you didn't have any um, any milk on doorsteps, put it that way. But nevertheless, I um, I became a bit of a recluse after my mum had got married and felt a bit vulnerable. And um, sometimes I was given words of abuse about my family situation. My nana went to a mental institution every day of the week and my granddad was very hard working. He, both were in the World War Two, and um, and I was searching for something. And I look back now and realise I've become very selfish. And um, 
but I was searching for something to make me happy. And uh, and if that word love was real, I was going to go and try and find it. Uh, when I was 11 and a half year old, I started to notice this gang, a gang of men. Um, they were different. They had no hair and wore boots and they had tattoos and they seemed to be very well respected in the town. And by the time I was 12 and a half, I was a member of this gang. I was with them um, 14 and 15 that where I was up with lots of criminal activities. And it's quite odd because when I was in town in Middlesbrough, uh, the police knew my name. It was kind of a, a badge of honour. It was a good thing. And it was a status. It was a street thing that, I thought it was really good for them to know my name and uh, I ended up um, getting involved with a lot of bad stuff when I was 15. Um, someone had died and other people were interviewed, including myself, about this and his death and, you know, it was a shocking time and anyway, when I was 16, I ended up going to jail in a medical detention centre in concert and um, go out of there and not long after that, my granddad died and, you know, my nana was um, obviously distraught and, you know, my nana was very poorly, she took a lot of tablets and a lot of medication, like actual medication. And, but she would tell me she loved me, my nana, um, and I, but I couldn't believe anyone really when they said they loved me. It didn't seem real. Um, and of course, in this gang, no one said they loved each other. They were, it was something they would never do. And um, anyway, after being in prison, my granddad died, and I got very reluctant to join these skinheads again. And I wanted to go in, on another route, really. So I remember being sat in the pub one night, and there was a load of men came in, young men with all these nice clothes on. It was a Saturday. And, They'd been to this football match, but they said they'd been fighting at this match, and I really, really kind of excited me that there was all these people, and they were talking about nightclubs and stuff like that. Well, anyway, well, I started to go to football matches, but obviously I'd been a, a, in another gang before then, and I didn't really know what you had to do, what you had to wear, or anything like that to go to these matches. Life Stories Worldwide is on YouTube and it's very easy to subscribe to our channel. Just click the bell and subscribe and receive notifications of when we are live or simply watch any of our other videos. So check it out and give us a visit. Um, so when I first went to a football match I stood out like a sore thumb. Um, not because I'm good looking, but because <laughs> uh, I'm really tall because of what I was wearing. And um, I soon realised that to be a football hooligan and like these men were, you needed money uh, because you, they, they all wore these fancy clothes, you know, nice clothes, track suits and trainers, and they all had like smart haircuts. And, and um, so I started to. Uh, start finding out how I would get money um, and the only way for me to get money was to stay to rob and uh, and then I started selling counterfeit clothes but I was interested in this mat these matches because I started to like the way they, they dressed but also there was a big big number of these men and, and some women that went to these matches and they kind of give you a lot of attention and um, it wasn't until I was in prison again, I went to a bar school called Diabold. When I got out of that bar school, I ended up going to the matches again and getting back right back into it. And I've had a lot of injuries. I've been cut across my eye here to where they didn't see it. I had a Stanley knife and had a sword across my head. And I've had a bottle in both my eyes. I had my little finger chopped off. And I've been stabbed in the arm and chest, four down, got no front teeth. And um, you know, the last major incident that happened to me, I had both of my shoulders pulled out the sockets um, and spending all the time in prison. And um, and for me, I didn't see, uh, I couldn't see anything else. There was 
know the life for me and um I suppose the worst time of my life at that time was when my nana died. You know, I was 20 year old and she died and it was like devastating. And um, I felt a lot of guilt, you know, a lot of like sadness of my promises to her and what I'd been doing and wondering, you know, I could never say sorry to her and kind of started haunting me and probably didn't realise that things were coming into my life then that were were not good, feeling a bit down and low and um but I was going getting worse as well when my nana died I was getting worse and you know, I'd go to these matches and you know I'd drink more and sometimes take drugs but not like the hard stuff that I ended up on and ended up starting not to care about myself so much, you know. Um I found myself in prison again in nineteen eighty nine and I was very, very low at this point when I went to prison and got out of prison in 1990, September. And, you know, I was thinking that in the prison about all the times of being injured and left in other cities and never got my lift home or being locked up or wondering about all these times of losing my freedom. And I thought I need to do something else in life, so I'm going to change and I'm going to go and live somewhere else. I ended up moving to a place called Wakefield and I got a job at my Stores Catalog Firm and life seemed to be okay. And then I started stealing from the factory and got the sack and wondered what I was going to do. And really, I, I'd only been left middle for two and a half months and I thought, I don't really want to go back because, you know, I've told everyone I'm going to leave and I'm going to change my life and I'm going to make something of myself and I felt a, bit, a lot of pride, you know, and so I was sat working on the doors of a nightclub and, and a pub and I was making money that way and, and, and uh, Christmas Eve, uh, sorry, New Year's Eve of 1990 to 1991, my dream of changing my life and living in a different area and going straight um, it, it fell apart. I hit a man um, in the pub, in the nightclub, sorry, and he was an undercover policeman and I ended up getting arrested and yeah, going to prison. I went to Leeds, Army Jail in Leeds and um, got very, very, very low in that prison. Just felt like a total failure. To, to, didn't know where I was going to turn, didn't know what I was going to do. So get released from prison. And the only um, thing in my life at that time that I thought would give me some hope was when I get back to Middlesbrough. I was on the train expecting, I told some people I'm coming home and I'm ex excited about getting home and maybe, you know, going drinking and partying and eating food in restaurants and just acting like someone I wasn't, you know, um, someone really who didn't deserve nice things. And, um, but I thought I did, I thought I did deserve them. And so I ended up um, getting back to Middlesbrough, get off the train, there's no one there waiting for me. And I, I kind of thought that, that I started making excuses that like I used to when I was young, when I, it was only me looked up or it was only me stabbed or something like that. I'd make excuses up about why that happened and I did exactly the same. I, I thought, well, they must have not known I'm here. You know, I'm home, I've got the days wrong. And so I um, I went about the town that day and bumped into people and people would say to me, no, oh, Graham, where have you been? We haven't seen you for a while. And I'm thinking, well, I've been gone nearly four years and you're saying you haven't seen me for a while. Not that I was expecting them to be saying he's Graham, Graham for mayor and a big band, but I did think someone would be, you know, wondering where I've been and having a chat with me and being like looking for me and, but it didn't. And I remember that night, you know, I got out and drank and drank and drank and anyway, that over that Christmas of 92, I, I started to like go really downhill, drinking so heavily and 1993 come and I've been sleeping anywhere I could really and um, still quite smart, always good looking <laughs> but um, I was 
really low and um anyway a cut long story short i ended up walking on the street on it's on linthorpe road on the grange road and there's a mcdonald's on the corner and as i walked on the corner i could hear this music and i walked up and there was a bench there and it's outside the middle of this main post up this court and on grange road and uh, all these lads and lasses were there and i didn't realize it was a red light district and but i knew that street well i knew the people who were there and it was a very dangerous street and i remember sitting on that bench and talking to these lads and lasses and well, what are you doing and it was like nearly the end of jan uh, nearly the end of february and they were saying i was just celebrating christmas live stories worldwide is broadcast live every monday night at 8 p.m uk time we broadcast on youtube facebook and StreamYard. Why not join us every Monday night at 8 p.m. UK time for live stories worldwide. I can't believe it. They're still celebrating Christmas at the end of February. They have this group of music player plaster thing like Get All Blaster, the called them, and uh, drinks and cannabis and you know, people smoking heroin and things like that. And anyway, that night I sat on that bench and everyone went and I thought, right, I want to live here. This is what I, I've enjoyed tonight. I want to live here. This is my home. And uh, and sure enough, that's where I lived for three years. First year I was drinking. The second year I was taking heroin as well and crack cocaine. And the third year I was really low, really desperately low. And um, I'd become a real tramp, you know. And what happened was a lot of my friends said they couldn't work it out because I'd gone from being a really, really smart dressed lad with a good physique and um, and to a tramp. I mean, a, 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 a terrible, terrible tramp, you know, and um, didn't care about me, didn't care about anything. And um, so in March 1996, I was sat there one Friday night and, the story's going to get really good now. And uh, I was um, sat on this bench and this man come up to me. It was a Friday night, it was a normal night, just a, a everyday night. I've been begging for money and I think I've got a few bob to make, get some drink and, you know, hopefully get some heroin off someone. And But I've got my drink for the night, you know, and stuff like that. And this man come over and he went to me, Hey, son, do you know Jesus loves you? And I chased him. I, th I think I said to him, please leave me alone in French. And uh, But they came back the week after. And I remember saying to this man, like, I can't even remember which one it was, but I said to one of them that, that night, I said, listen, there's no such word as love. You know, I mentioned it when I, was, when I first began. This word love uh, is not real. Uh, it's man-made, it's a man manipulation tool and what happens if you want somebody to tell them you love them and uh, and as for Jesus, my nan was telling about Jesus when I was young and my nana didn't have such a good life so you can go away, I don't want to know but that year, 1996, August 9th, 1996, I went into a coma now because of how I'd lived for three years not eating, drinking water and living out in the cold, I've got some real major things wrong with me, uh, hyperthermia, uh, um, pneumonia, my liver was packing in, I had kidney failure, I had severe dehydration and um, se severe malnutrition, I had septicemia and I was I was dead, no, that was it, there was no response from me and you know, just transferred me from one hospital to another hospital, blue lighted. And uh, when they found me, they wrapped me up in foil and put me in a bag. And people walked by and seen Gran getting put into a body bag. And with, within in a, at least 15, 20 minutes, it was around Middlesbrough that I was dead. And um, but I, I ended up, as I say, in this coma and my mother being called to the hospital. And she didn't really want to come, but when she did come, she was told that these are the forms, turn the machine off that's keeping them breathing. And they went away and, uh, you know, my mum said, 
I need a couple of hours and she walked away and these men came out told me about Jesus, uh, Pete Naden and Nicky had been, well, it wasn't just them, but they were the ones who came to the hospital. And they asked my mum if it would pray for me. And um, they came into the room where my mother was, into this little um, 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 room where I had all these tubes coming up me, intensive care room. And uh, they prayed for me. And that said in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, give this man new life. And I woke up, I pulled the ventilator machine off, out my throat. And it's because I was choking when I woke up and I was alive. And my mum went running for the consultant, Dr. Cope Smith, and said, listen, you told me, told us he was dead. You wanted me to turn the machine off. And yet he's alive. And after getting examined and sitting back to sleep, uh, the man went, he made a remarkable recovery, <laughs> so it was a miracle. It was a miracle. My mum said it's a miracle, and um, she says that in my video. When you you know watch my video, you, you see it. But then I was in hospital for nearly seven weeks, and I just nearly seven weeks, and I had to learn to get a walk again. And you know I was in bed for three weeks. I couldn't get out of bed because obviously my legs wouldn't move and very ill, very poorly. I was having lots of tests done. I'd go down to CT scans and blood took and you ran every day just about. And, you know, I had a lot of time to think and I thought a lot about my past and hated it, really hated my past. I hated what I'd done to people. I would threaten them, my mum and my stepdad and my nan and my granddad and everyone, I just hated what I'd done. And um, but when I came out of the hospital, I went to live in a, another estate called Winniebanks where I'd been living for a while. And I, I remember living in the back bedroom of a house and someone put a video of David Hamilton on the next UVF terrorist in there. I remember watching it and thinking, wow, this man's like telling the truth. I really believe him that he found Jesus in prison, and they, he, when I found him, he, he really did. He really had changed, and um, so I, had, I asked these Christian men, Pete and Ned, and where can I find out more if it's real? And they told me to go to an Alpha course, and I went to an Alpha course in in nineteen ninety six, and I didn't really listen. But when it came to why did Jesus die? I was blown away because I didn't realise that Jesus died for, for the likes of me. I was a self-confessed scumbag who didn't deserve anything and couldn't come to terms with forgiving myself and hated me at times and didn't like me because of what I'd done and here I was now being told that Jesus died for me, for me, what a scumbag and a dirty low-life tricks I've done. And yet this man Jesus died for me and I went back the week after and the week after and on November the 9th, 1996, a quarter three, I said to Jesus, if you were real and you love me, you'll come into my life and help me and make, and, and, and tell me, show me you love me because words aren't enough. I said, I've been told I was loved by lots of people and that wasn't real. And there and then I fell on, on my chair and started to cry. And I really knew that the three important things in our life that we need to know is who we are, where we're from and where we're going. If you would like to speak to us here at Life Stories Worldwide Radio, you can simply by dialing plus four four seven nine four three double five zero two eight seven. Call us now 